Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Ontario Aquaculture Research Centre. I'm your host, Kaylee Moore, one of the agricultural assistants here at OARC. If you're looking to learn more about aquaculture, you're in the right place. On today's episode, we have Tiago Hori joining us all the way from PEI to discuss his current role as the Director of Aquaculture Innovation at the Atlantic Aqua Farms. Hi guys and welcome back to our channel. I'm super excited to introduce Tiago Hori today. Uh, we'll be discussing Tiago's role as the Director of Aquaculture Innovation at the Atlantic Aqua Farms Company. So Tiago, um, you are the biologist turned biochemist turned uh, psychologist turned geneticist turned now programmer. Um, how are you using all these skills in your current role? Yeah, so um, when I started, I was really looking at, at the importance of physiological processes uh, in aquaculture in terms of growth and feed and all of these things. And that slowly evolved into looking at a different level, which was the, um, uh, the genetic mechanisms behind that. And then to a further thing, which was the, you know, now what are the gen genomic ex structures that are contributing, contributing to these genetic um, mechanisms that then lead to different phenotypes of phenotypes of interest. And so I, uh, you know, uh, the turning to genetics and then obviously from genetics to genomics then required um, a shift into bioinformatics and, 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 uh, and the programming. But now a lot of what I do is, is trying to really more than conduct the research is to find vehicles and 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 ways to implement these innovation techniques uh, into aquaculture. And I did it a long time, the last before I started here in the last five years with um, uh, with fish. So trying to implement breeding technologies from traditional breeding to genetic assisted or market assisted breeding to all genomic assisted breeding. Um, and being on the interface with the clients, that was, I think, the biggest part of my transition is, is to go through the process of understanding uh, the difference between the science that you do in academia and your priorities in academia and, and how that can then be translated into something that the industry can, can use uh, and that, that is feasible to use with, with a target species. And so, uh, you know, uh, the skills, the scientific skills allows me, they allow me to be staying in, in touch with what is the state of the art of the technology and the approaches. But really now what I really is using in terms of my experience is, is to be in that interface between uh, academia and and industry and then using the scientific background to to try to evaluate what is out there and what is the, the potential that a new technology has uh, for the industry, but also to evaluate how long we think it's going to take to get that to an application. So some technologies, we may look at it and say, well, we should start doing that right now. It's ready for, for use. And some other technologies, we look at it and there's a lot of potential that, but there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. Uh, and, and trying to make those judgments of where we put our research dollars uh, and our efforts to try to get the largest return for the company in terms of of, of our investment. So it's a, it's a little bit of a different perspective uh, of science that a lot of people in biology have because it's it's highly focused on application. No, that's super cool. I mean, I know that's super important is looking at different um, techniques out there and making sure, you know, you're getting the most out of what you're investing your time and money and all that stuff into. And that's really interesting. I know here at our research center, we we grow fin fish. Um, how different is the aquaculture production for mussels? Well, uh, so the biggest difference, I think, well, there's many, but the, I think the, 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 the most drastic re difference uh, between finfish aquaculture in general and shellfish aquaculture is that there's no organic inputs in, in, in shellfish industry. In other words, there's no feeding. So uh, all shellfish aquaculture that exists today is based on, on animals that feed on natural occurring uh, algae or phytoplankton. Uh, and and that, that, is, it, that creates a huge difference because 
um, when you're not inputting carbon and nitrogen into the environment, uh, you have a, la a lesser footprint, environmental footprint for aquaculture. So shellfish aquaculture uh, is less targeted as a... Um, as an industry in the aquaculture spectrum, as other, especially salmon uh, uh, aquaculture, where then there is a, a significant input of of carbon into the environment, um, you know, and and in fact, shellfish aquaculture now is being seen as a potential remediation uh, 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 technique for degraded environments. And one of the biggest examples is a project that is. Uh, uh, in, in New York City, it's called the One Billion Oyster Project, where they grow oysters to try to uh, um, clean the Hudson River uh, from from the historical pollution that New York City has dumped into that river. And so they have programs there just releasing oysters into the environment to try to see. And it and it's interesting too because oysters are. Uh, native to that bay, and they were overfished. Basically, uh, New, New York used to be New York State used to be the largest producer of of, uh, of oysters in, in North America, uh, and like now, there's barely no oysters coming out of that state just because the, the Hudson Valley is so polluted that you can't eat those oysters. Basically. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, um, but you just answered that if they were native to the area, which I mean, that's a win for them. That oysters are native there and they can use, utilize um, the oyster to hopefully make a good impact there. Um, so originally like mussel seed stock came from the wild. Um, is this practice still used? Yeah, so in North America, all the mussel culture, I mean, 80% of the mussels grown in North America come out of PEI. And we, in PEI, we still all completely reliant on, on uh on what we call wild seed or nat naturally uh, seed that is naturally occurring seed. Um, in in the West Coast, there's a, there's a small hatchery uh, in South Spring Islands that is uh, producing a little bit of seed, but not in in large amounts. The there the only real big hatchery uh, for mussels is in New Zealand. Uh, so that's for the green lip mussels, and they produced a fair amount. I think it's one third of their seed demand um, for for their mussel culture. Uh, you know, it's a classical uh, kind of history of uh, uh, of nature or kind of ranching based uh, agriculture. Is that you know, as long as there's no pressures, environmental pressures, there's really no push to go to artificial production of seeds. Uh, you see that in tons of species. Um, and what is happening now with climate change, and well, we think part of it is climate change, but human impacts in the environment and all of these things is that seed shortages are becoming more frequent. Um, you know, they had some significant issues in New Zealand, uh, and New Zealand has a very particular uh, system because all their seed is collected in one place in New Zealand. Uh, they had issues with the oyster beds in the uh, northern part of Europe, uh, in the Netherlands and and Germany and and the Walden Old Walden Sea in general. They have seed problems in um, in Scotland. So obviously, we're, things are shifting now uh, towards the investigation of and the development of those hatchery techniques. And I think. Eventually, we'll see, much like we've seen, we've seen to what, what other species, a transition into oyster production of seed. Uh, I, I don't know if that will ever be a full replacement, just because getting seed from the from from the wild is or from nature is very straightforward and cheap. Uh, but I, certainly, the environmental pressures are leading us towards the need for hatchery techniques for mussels. Um, and it's something that happened to oysters many years ago because the oysters were far overfished than mussels. And so, uh, you know, relying on oyster capture seed, which some aquaculture, oyster aquaculture people still do, is not as feasible as for mussels. And so the oyster, the oyster industry has a history of hatchery production that, is, that dates almost at least 50 years, but probably more. 
and and they are much more developed. There is, you know, uh, the French industry, for example, is almost fully reliant in in oyster in high trade produce, and so is the British. Uh, a lot of the American industry, our industry here is is certainly moving into high trade oyster too in PEI, and so it's been uh, a, a, you know the oyster industry has moved into that direction, and I, I think that the muscle industry will move that to that direction in the next ten. To 20 years too. Yeah, I think it will be very interesting to see. I know um, beforehand we were briefly talking about like how um, the oyster industry and stuff like that is not as large uh, per se here um, in our country. I know like we, I don't know tons of people in my family say more specific that eat oysters that don't love say seafood in general. But I think as time will tell um, and it gets bigger in our country that, you know, Hopefully, we are able to follow suit as, uh, you know, the British and stuff like that and be able to develop those techniques. I mean, we have tons of species here uh, in Canada that don't uh, produce in hatcheries. Like, it's all wild. So, like, I've talked to some students that do sea urchins and sea cucumbers and all that stuff, and that's all in the wild as well. Um, A lot of the sturgeon hatcheries and stuff like that also run off of wild caught as well. So, like you're saying, it's cheap and it's uh, it works right now. But as time will tell, you know, hopefully we're able to adapt and uh, grow that part of the industry. Yeah, and I think there's there's is a, is a two pronged kind of uh, uh, approach there, and it has two main roads to be followed. One one is the security, right? So once you secure hatchery, produce seed, then you secure source of seed, which is perhaps the most pressing issue that we have but the other side that goes into it is that once you have hatcheries then you have the potential of breeding you know and and then once you have the potential of breeding and then that's the whole universe that then all of a sudden opens for you into uh improvement of the quality of the animal of the nutritional quality of the uh, of of the animal but also from an environmental perspective if we can increase growth rates uh, and then reduce footprint, then that's always also uh, a desirable um, um, uh, uh, thing. You know, we talk about uh, growing the seafood industry to provide food for the world, as at the as the FAOA uh, project predicts. But we have to do it sustainably. So we need to be able to grow production with minimal growth footprint, uh, and breeding is the way to do it. Um, uh, and so, especially in species that are not have not been bred at all, there's so much potential in things like mussels and Arctic char and and all these species. Because you know, we used to say that about salmon 20, 20 years ago. You know, there's so much potential in salmon for breeding because that genetic variation is untapped, and that is not so much the truth anymore because a lot of that genetic variation has been harnessed. It's not as if salmon breeding is at its limit, but I mean, if you look at what they've accomplished in um, in in Norway, for example, they have a they have a, a salmon that has a feeding conversion rate rate of almost below one, right? So they're producing they're producing a biomass with less amount. They're producing more biomass than the feed that is being input in the system, basically. Yeah, uh, which, which is incredible, right? And that's all traditional breeding. So when you no, think about that in mussels and these species that haven't been bred yet, there's all that potential out there in there still. Yeah, and I think uh, that's, uh, for myself, like, that's a really cool aspect to see is, like, uh, you know, I know here from at our facility, we're trying to kind of um, culture lake whitefish for the first time here at our facility, and it's been done before. Um, it's been proven it is capable. Um, you see it over... Uh, in different countries that they already do it. Um, So I know being a part, getting to be a part of that and seeing that grow because I know, especially in Northern Ontario, you know, Lake Whitefish is, you know, a a favorite. It's what you see in restaurants up North. It's a very local fish. So I think that's, it's very important and it'll be very cool to see and watch things grow and adapt. And like you're saying, you know, it's possible we just, you know, need to get there and be able to have the facilities and things like that. So 
Um, but we'll just continue on here and we'll talk about how PI is world renowned for their muscles. So from here, how are we going to improve uh, shellfish production? I know you just kind of touched upon it a little bit, but is there anything else you can add to that? Yeah, I think so. PI has an interesting uh, history in that, where you know it's really uh, PI, uh, the muscle industry in PI is really the um, uh, an example of the power of ingenuity. Um, you know, it all started with small family growers and you know, and people that just refined the day-to-day farm operations from sea collection to socking to length of socks and positions and harvesting. Uh, you know, I think the biggest example of how creative the producers are is um, uh, PI is the only place in the world that harvests mussels under, under solid ice in the winter, which was a practice that was developed here, you know, and, 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 and we went from using handheld um, 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 chainsaws with like five foot long uh, blades to you. Now we have these four wheelers that have uh, that have chainsaws installed in front of them and then they dig the trenches in the ice. And so I think that allowed PEI to grow its industry um, significantly and become this powerhouse. And then of course there's the fact that we have pristine uh, waters and a very small human footprint which keep the, the waters clean. Uh, access to good food, and then that's a very good product. But uh, I think, you know, we are reaching the top end of where that level of innovation can grow this industry. And now we need to move into more of the systematic approach uh, to get uh, better gains. So much like as we talked in the in the breeding program when you did have the genetic ver- uh, variability on tap, the same thing is worth through for innovation. When I, when a, when an industry is starting, there's all this untapped potential because you haven't optimized uh, the procedures. But there's only so much you can gain by optimization of procedures, and then the gains after a certain period become smaller and smaller and smaller as you optimize because you're not getting 50% gains anymore by optimizing a certain procedure. You're getting five or ten, you know, and in small increments. And so to go back to gaining these large increments, we need to tap into other technologies. But that is not only breeding. Uh, it, it, it's uh, automation, artificial intelligence, uh, and all these things that are, that are, are, are coming up. And they all... Uh, they all come around into a concept that uh, um, of uh, of intelligent agriculture, uh, or so you know, intelligent farming came up in, in for grains a, a while ago, and then and then intelligent farming is this idea that you can now make decisions that are based on data. So you're collecting data from water quality to growth to everything you can, and you ge- and you're using that data not to replace farm managers, but to allow farm managers to make informed decisions um, of how they manage the farms and then to gain and, and, and so to uh, to get to that precision farming or the precision aquaculture, there's a lot of things we need to do is uh, to understand how can we use machine learning and uh, and all of these things and how do we better collect data collect and manage data and 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 really get to a point where uh, we're um, doing things in the most effective way possible. So uh, it, it's time, and now is the time to harness all these things uh, and, 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 move, and move the aquaculture industry step forward towards uh, where fruits and, 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 you know, and other products are, um, which are farther ahead in, in that kind of um, space. So that's where we want to be. So obviously, you know, uh, getting to the biological side of it is is where I work the most, but always with this kind of looking where where food, pr- food production is going as a whole. And, and I, I think the other, the large, the technology is going to be the large, have the largest impact in food production in the next 20 years. It's artificial intelligence. So I have no no doubt. Yeah, like I know here um, we upgraded and got uh, Aqua Manager a couple of years ago before I started. And 
I know like even for us here, like I, I know it's some companies have probably had something like that, but even here it's been able to help us like dial in on like feeding rations and making sure like our growth is at its optimal and um, especially like working with our white fish and being able to sample them and look at charts that are created in this um, software for us. Uh, so we can see the growth and say, okay, where can we dial in a little bit better to make this optimal as the fish grows? So from when we get the lake white fish in our quarantine facility, we know that they eat this well, and this is the growth. And then we're, <clears throat> excuse me, and then we're seeing something else different, like in our grow out, out in our bigger tanks. And now we're seeing something different. Like it's really helpful and beneficial, especially I know for like Marcia, she doesn't have to run around and collect this data from us and get it off papers, um, we we're able to input it right into the system ourselves. And she can go right to a tank and say, this is what this tank is doing. And um, it's it's really amazing. And it makes, I think, everybody's day and like overall work life easier when it comes to that aspect for sure. Yeah. So the next step is how do we do that for like 10 million individuals? Exactly. You know, in, in 15 different farm sites, right? Uh it's taking that concept of the tailoring that you can do on an experimental or on a small tank perspective and trying to uh, to use AI to make that possible in an environment that is less controlled. Uh, and then there's lots more animals, right? And so the, the possibility to crunch in that level of data and seeing patterns uh, is, is now becoming a reality where before you could only think about doing that in a more controlled, small, small environment. So you're absolutely right. It's taking that concept of managing that you can do in in a smaller setting, but then can we take that to uh, to the farm environment and do something, you know, and then do what they call precision farming. So dialing everything, uh, harvest. When do you harvest? You know, when do you harvest every cohort? Uh, can you do harvest plants based on genotyping and on temperature cycles to predict uh, whether the extra time in the water gives you a growth that is worth the trouble, right? So that's that's one classical example. Uh, it's trying to evaluate is it really worth to keep the animal in the water for the growth you're going to gain based on predictions uh, and how much that's going to cost and what is the value of the extra product you're getting and then making a decision of whether you harvest them now or in six months or in eight months. All of those things um, uh, hopefully will become feasible as we get ways of measuring things in high throughput and and uh, and doing that kind of thing. So that's that's the challenge now, which is really interesting, is how do you make measurements at at, at high throughput? Right. Yeah, exactly. It's really interesting. There's some really interesting technologies coming about that they use in the fruit industry of multiple cameras, and they can determine a weight of um, of a fruit based on photographs, or at least get a, get a good estimate. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that we are looking at into trying to investigate for the next 20 years. Yeah, no, there definitely uh, there's lots. I think that's going to be coming up very shortly, even. Uh, and we'll see some advancements. Um, kind of, are you able to tell us uh, about your career opportunities, uh, like look like for someone who may want to get in the sh uh, like shellfish aquaculture industry? Yeah, so I think I think the I think you will see that the shellfish industry is picking is going to start picking up its um, uh, RD side, and, and so obviously shellfish pretty behind rela related to finfish, but. As, as the industry grows, you, you, you will see uh, a larger effort into uh, into breeding programs. And I know that the guys in New Brunswick are starting a breeding program down at the Etang Husso in, in, in New Brunswick. Um, um, and there's a couple hatcheries coming up in 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 the in that area. So I think. Um, you will see two kinds of uh, opportunities. You will see the more the hatchery technician uh, kind of opportunity certainly coming up, um, and and which we struggle now because there's very little training on that area and in aquaculture in general, but you know especially in the shellfish uh, environment. 
but I, I think also that there will be growing opportunities on the research side of, of shellfish. So the things that we've been doing for fish for a long time, diet optimization and larval culture and, and spawning and, and, you know, all the things that we've been doing for the last 30 years in salmonids, uh, you know, from trying to understand uh, uh, egg to sperm ratios and all these, like, very basic biological questions. I think that all those things are going to start certainly becoming more more common. And uh, you see opportunities, I think, both on the academic side and also on the industry side. Oh, perfect. Um, I was going to talk about, uh, touch base about the muscles and PI, and I know for myself, like, um, I love shellfish. It's I, I mean, I love fish. I love seafood in general, but... I'll never forget going out to PI when I was a bit younger and uh, I had like my first taste of like fresh mussels like on PI Island. I was like, I can't eat like I can't eat mussels anywhere else ever again. Yeah. I was like, these are amazing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you guys are doing excellent work out there. And I want to thank you, Tiago, for joining me today and sharing with us the work uh, you are doing in producing uh a breed better, a stronger and more delicious mussel for um, our country and that and pr your province more specifically. Um, this this is a great positive effect on the aquaculture industry and I'm looking forward to what the years uh, ahead brings. So I don't know if you have anything else to add before we head out, but... Uh, no, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's always a good opportunity for us to like, shed some light in the industry. It's an industry that uh, some, a lot of people get surprised at the amount of how important PI and as a concept Canada is in that in that market, um, and so you know we're always and you know sh I think shellfish is going to play an important role in, in 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 the future as a source of good protein and good uh, essential essential fatty acids and things like that, and so. Um, because, for example, uh, if you look at DHA and EPA, obviously salmon has a lot of it, but again, salmon is expensive. Now, shellfish has a lot of e e e EPA and DHA content, too, for a much lower price. So if you're thinking about supplementation of essential fatty acids in diets, uh, shellfish are potentially a much better, a much more feasible, not better, but a much more feasible source. Hey guys, I hope you liked the video today. If you did, please swim on over and hit the like button and subscribe. Comment below if you have any questions you want answered in any of our future videos. Hope to see you next time.